bed. I didn't hear anything. <laughs> there we go. Good morning. As we begin our service, we acknowledge that we gather from across the traditional lands of the Western Abenaki people. We pay respect to their elders, both past and present. I am the Reverend Joan Javier Duval, Minister of the Unitarian Church of Montpelier. I use she, her pronouns, and I extend to you a warm welcome. Today, we celebrate the diversity of life experiences within our church community. Individuals of all ages from across the lifespan have been invited to share their response to the question posed in Mary Oliver's poem, The Summer Day. What is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Thank you for joining us in this time of worship from wherever you are. Whether you are on Zoom, on Facebook, or watching the service on your own time, we deeply appreciate your presence and fellowship. For over 155 years, the Unitarian Church of Montpelier has been a sanctuary for those seeking both spiritual sustenance and peace and justice in the world. Whether you are a newcomer, a longtime member, or somewhere in between, you are a part of this community and we're glad that you are here. If you are joining us in Zoom, the chat function will be on for much of the service. It's a great way to publicly welcome and support one another, to affirm the hard work and effort of our worship team and to share good vibes and positive thoughts with one another. For technical issues or constructive feedback, please send a private message to one of our Zoom hosts, indicated with an asterisk in front of their name, or you can join us for coffee hour after the service to share your thoughts there. Thank you to our virtual greeters and our, uh, who are offering hospitality and tech help throughout the service. Additionally, on Zoom, you can click on the live transcript button wherever it lives on your screen for increased accessibility. I invite you now to take a moment to turn your video on if it is not on, to go into gallery view on your Zoom screen. Let us greet our neighbors with a wave hello and a warm smile. Again, a warm welcome to each and every one of you. I have a couple of announcements about the life of our congregation. Please save the date for a congregational meeting in two weeks on Sunday, February 13th. The meeting will address the eighth principle as well as the air quality project. A formal warning for, from the UCM governing board will be coming soon. And please read the weekly e-newsletter to learn more about the upcoming events in our church, community, and the latest updates on major church happenings. Now, let us enter more deeply into our time of worship with our prelude. Thank you to all of the children who created the artwork that we are sharing along with the prelude this morning.
My name is Eliza Homick, and our opening words this morning are The Summer Day by Mary Oliver. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass, the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? And now please join us in our opening hymn, Come, Come, Whoever You Are, number 188 in our hymnal, led by three generations of the Sassaman family, Madeline, Jennifer, Ginny, and Bob. Thank you so much, Sassaman family. Let us now light the chalice, symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. As Mara Iverson lights the chalice here in our sanctuary, I invite you to light a chalice at home if you have one nearby. We light this flame, an enduring symbol of our collective commitment to lead with truth and compassion. And please join me in saying these words of affirmation <laughs> adapted from Universalist Minister <laughs> L. Griswold Williams. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve human need, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine, thus do we covenant. Throughout this morning's service, you will hear reflections from 10 members of our church community. 
Liam Javier Duval, Callum Robichek, Amy Lindemann Sweet, Mara Iverson, Jeremy Beaudry, Tamara Martini, Ruth, Ruth Witte, Tom Shurston, Art Stuckey, and Anne Sarka. Thank you to each of you for sharing with us this morning. Their reflections will be interspersed throughout the service and will be shared more or less in order of age. One reflection is in the form of music. We begin with our youngest contributor. Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Hang out in my head. Go to karate class every week once I'm done with so-called educational school. Finish my arcade and build a place in the basement where I can finally have some peace and quiet. Hey, my name's Amy Lindemann Sweet and I use she, her pronouns. The quote, tell me what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life, makes me feel inspired. The line in the poem, everything dies at last and too soon, hits me hard to live more deeply in the now, because it's truly all we have. I suppose that's why they say the present is a gift. I'm not a poker player, but when I entered the world, I was dealt what they call in poker a bad hand. Not a WHIP, which means worst hand in poker, but a bad hand. Um, I even had a therapist tell me one time that I had experienced the most trauma he had ever heard. It's a true story. <laughs> I was born into dysfunction and then adopted into dysfunction. I spent years being a hurricane, causing those around me, and mostly myself, torment and destruction. I have the emotional scars and wounds to prove it. I hit a point in my early 20s where I couldn't keep running from my own suffrage and trauma. It was at that moment that with the help of spiritual communities, I turned my will and my life over to the care of a higher power of my understanding. I began to clean up the wreckage of my past while healing through my own traumas and creating a better life for my future. I became the first in my biological family to not only go to college, but to go on to graduate school where I graduated with above a 4.0 GPA. I also became the first person to get sober in my families. Today, I stand before you as a 33-year-old woman with over 10 years without a drink, married to a loving and amazing wife, and working my dream job where I get to guide people through their own problems, traumas, and pain. My wife is also nine months pregnant and conceived through RIVF with our first child. I find myself in the birth canal towards parenthood with emotional and psychological contractions happening as many of the nouns in my life slowly start adjusting and changing. What I'm going to do with my one precious life is stay sober, love and support my wife and our future children, form deeper connections with my family, friends, spiritual communities, and God, stay in the moment, pray for my higher power's will for me, and do the next right thing. I look forward to owning a home one day, four bedroom, three bath with attached two car garage, in case you're wondering, <laughs> and continuing to grow our family. For my adventure is truly just beginning. I'm a standing example that it's not what you're dealt in the game of life, but how you play your hand. What is it that you wish to do with your one wild and precious life? Well, I'm gonna eat cake, a lot of cake. I'm going to eat it with my friends when we're noting that either I or one of them has made another entire trip around the sun. I'm going to eat it with young hopefuls at their mosquito-ridden graduation parties as they tell me what they plan to do with their wild and precious life. I'm even going to eat it on some Sunday afternoon, rain or shine, just because I'm a grown-up and no one can stop me from getting a cupcake at Shaw's anytime I want or need one. And cross your fingers here, folks, but I'm sure hoping that I'm gonna eat cake with my partner and our beloveds on some still to be determined date in 2023. It's a ritual, you see the exchanging of rings and eating of cake and agreeing to raise our dog together even though neither of us wants to be the one to take her out before bed on a cold January night. 
Cake is a part of many rituals, rituals of gathering and sharing and witnessing together. Ah, the carefree days of bringing a fork full of cake to your mouth at such a gathering without noting how close you were standing to another person who happened to be eating cake or wondering about said cake eater's stance on vaccines. That's what I'm going to do with my wild and precious life. I'm going to mark occasions and spend time with loved ones and follow my own lead about what I want and need. And I mean, of course, I'll probably also teach people about sex ed and supporting LGBTQ people and anti-racism because I want to eat cake in a more just and equitable world. But mostly, I'm going to eat cake and revel in presence. And just in case you're wondering, in fact, I know you must be, I like vanilla coconut cake best. Thank you, Mara, Amy, and Liam. Generosity is a spiritual value that is central to our personal well being and the well being of our church community. It is a blessing and a privilege of our free church tradition to support the shared values of this congregation with the generosity of our collective financial resources. Each month, through the UCM Community Pouch Program, we share part of our collection with an important church fund or community organizations aligned with our values. During the month of January, our community pouch recipients are Vermont Relief Collective and Salon Black Walnut. Both groups are led by people of color and build culture through connecting people, land, and food ways here in Vermont. Your contribution to the UCM Community Pouch this month will directly support this work. You can make a financial contribution today by donating online. Go to ucmvt.org and click Donate to UCM. There are options to contribute to the general fund, to the community pouch, or both. You can also mail a check to the church, or you can use our text to give option. Simply send a text message with the word give to the number 802-266-4848 and follow the instructions that are sent to you. We are so grateful to each and every one of you for your generosity in its many forms. While the offering is being given and gratefully received, please enjoy a musical offering from Callum Robichek. The musical offering is Callum's response to the prompt for today's service. Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life?
Good morning. My name is Jeremy Beaudry. I remember when I was a kid, how slowly time seemed to pass while waiting for something to happen. A friend to arrive, the school bell to ring, or perhaps even the church service to finally end. The waiting was insufferable. I could feel the hands of the clock creaking as they made way around the seconds, minutes, and hours. But I'm middle-aged now, and time seems to pass so much more quickly. It's a kind of inflation. The currency of time just doesn't buy what it used to. My perception is of time flying by or slipping away as my life's reservoir of time drains with increasing velocity. This dawning sense of time frames how I think about the poet's question. What is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? The author Oliver Berkman writes in his latest book, 4,000 Weeks, which is the approximate life expectancy of someone like me. At the end of your life, looking back, whatever compelled your attention from moment to moment is simply what your life will have been. Uh-oh, there's a problem and that my attention is often fractured, usurped and disrupted by so many competing attractions. Some enriching, some not so much. A waterfall of obligations, responsibilities and commitments require my attention too. Mary Oliver's poem asks the question we are reflecting on today. And it also points me toward a response when she tells us almost defensively, I do know how to pay attention. Her poetry has taught me about looking and listening and feeling and experiencing and loving the world, especially the natural landscape. In the summer day, and perhaps all her poems, she beckons us to pay attention to this wildlife we inhabit. A durable, if aspirational answer to her question, one that might sustain me for the rest of my days is this, be present and pay attention. But also more importantly, pay attention to what I'm paying attention to. I want to pay attention to the things that enrich me, that strengthen my connection with my fellow humans, other earthly cohabitants and the vast cosmic ecology holding us all together. I want to pay attention to this fact of our interconnectivity. If at the subatomic level, the boundaries between you and me, between me and everything in this great universe are less solid than we perceive because some atomic particles are in fact dancing in between us, then let me pay attention to all that surrounds me in order to live into this grand interconnectivity, which is also a practice of building empathy with others and our world. This is what I plan to do. Good morning, my name is Tamara Martini. I have no plan for my one wild and precious life. I've attempted to make to-do lists just for the day, shortening the list to six tasks to prevent being overwhelmed, but I have a hard time sticking to that list to its completion. Something always intervenes and hijacks my best laid plans. I table those that can be postponed to attend to what is at hand. It may be frustrating to those who would like to map out their year, week, or even day to be in such flux, but I thrive on chaos. Work crises are design opportunities that build teamwork and a feeling of self-worth when we come together to reach creative solutions. A shaft of sunlight hitting my desk calls me to put on my snowshoes to tramp through the woods in the Arctic quiet. A grouse explodes out of the snow from under a nearby bush, a magical moment. A passing jest from a friend about visiting my daughter in New Zealand reimagined my spring and led to plane tickets and a, and a, uh, a rental of a camper van. The resulting experience was a sensory extravaganza and a chance to meet and discuss social issues with people from across the world. An email from a friend inviting me to take part in a Gilbert and Sullivan production required me to repress my natural shyness and insecurity to perform on stage and to give up hours of my spring and summer. But it welcomed me into a family of the theatrical troupe. When opportunities knock, I open the door. It could be a trek to an isolated mountain in Peru where I learn about the lore and history of the ancient culture and become aware firsthand of the impact of global warming. 
or it could be a chance meeting with someone who, as I get to know them, I find are kindred spirits. Or it could be a simple walk through the woods where I discover a patch of wildflowers that test me to identify. With each opportunity, I try to explore to the fullest, taking time to observe with mindfulness and absorb the experience as part of my being. I challenge myself to learn, to hone skills, and to push my body to be physically ready to take on new op opportunities. I have no plan in life except to live with as few regrets as possible. I am game for adventure because I don't want to miss opportunities. At the end of the day, I hope I have enriched my time with all the experiences I can. And my only plan is to keep filling the next day with more. Hi, I'm Ruth Witte. Standing in my little shoes as a three-year-old, the brilliant crazy quilt of life lying before me, I have no idea what making such a thing of beauty entails. Everything in life is a metaphor, if you think about it. Doing the dishes and laundry, gardening, cooking, being a grandmother, retiring, all endless opportunities for new beginnings. When making a quilt to create a tangible hug for a beloved friend or family member, I do not remain focused on the trials which are apparent on the backside of the quilt, missing the seam allowance by a thread and bunching fabric or loopy thread, chronic illness, cancer, alcoholism, mental illness, racism, gender identity. It would be noticed immediately if the quilt were to be assembled with the inside out. The quilt maker knows the mess within, but in the end, these memories fade into a thing of beauty as we continue stitching our lives together. Life is completely unpredictable. It's sharing love and beauty that keeps us grounded, whether that's making a delicious meal, handing the bouquet of flowers to a stranger, tracking down an old friend, watching the bird feeder, sharing a treasured family recipe to forward an ancestor's legacy, or reminiscing about days gone by as we downsize. Everywhere we look, there is a spark of beauty, even in the darkest moments. Given the unpredictability of day-to-day -day life, to see and set an example of kindness and generosity to increase the flow of love and beauty in the universe, seeing and creating delight in the lives in the lives of those who cross my path is the one thing I count on myself for. The going won't be easy when we are faced with our next life faltering event. The sewing machine can be precise, to say the least but wait till you have the masterpiece I contribute to every day. Thank you, Ruth, Tamara, and Jeremy. I invite you into a time of meditation and prayer, a time that we set aside for settling into quiet reflection and for tuning into the condition of our hearts and spirit. We begin by acknowledging the joys and the sorrows that we bring with us into this time of worship. You may be celebrating something special in your life or feeling grateful for a particular person or experience, or you may be facing a challenge or a loss that is heavy on your heart. In just a moment, I'll invite you to share your joys and concerns as you are moved in the Zoom chat. First, I invite you to hold in your heart UCM member Paul Hartman. 
Paul has had an extended stay in the intensive care unit in Burlington post-surgery, and his recovery has been slow. He isn't able to receive flowers or phone calls at this time, but would appreciate cards sent to his home or a caring email sent to his wife, Barbara, who can forward them to him when he is stronger. Barbara and Paul, we are sending you our love and wishes for Paul's ever growing strength and recovery. And now you are welcome to share your own joys and concerns in the Zoom chat or the Facebook comments so that we might offer one another our care and support. We ask that you share only those joys and concerns that are personal to you. If you have a concern to share that pertains to someone in our church community, please do ask permission before sharing on their behalf. Mary Jane Olson is our lay pastoral caregiver this morning. She's available to lend a listening ear of care after the service. Mary Jane's phone number will be shared in the Zoom chat and is also available in our church directory. May you each know that you are held in the love of this community and the expansive love that moves beyond us. And I invite you to take a breath, to allow your mind and your body to come to stillness. And I share with you these words of meditation by Angela Herrera. All that you need lies within you. Consider this an invitation to you. Yes, you, with all your happiness and your burdens, your hopes and regrets. An invitation if you feel good today and an invitation if you do not, if you are aching. And there are so many ways to ache. Whoever you are, however you are, wherever you are in your journey, this is an invitation into peace. Peace in your heart and peace in your heart. And with every breath, peace in your heart. Maybe your heart is heavy or hardened. Maybe it's troubled and peace can take up residence only in a small corner, only on the edge with all that is going on in the world and in your life. Nimodo, it doesn't matter. All that you need for a deep, and comforting peace to grow lies within you. Once it is in your heart, let it spread into your life. Let it pour from your life into the world. And once it is in the world, let it shine upon all beings. And let us join now in a time of quiet meditation.
Good morning. My name is Tom Sherston, and my response to the summer day is entitled The Winter Night. Who made the night sky? Who made the canopy of stars shining down upon us? Who flung the planets into their ellipt elliptical orbits? Who made the planets? Who made elliptical orbits? Who explodes the northern lights into the cold night skies? Who made the moon and set it in motion around the earth? What made the moon and set it in motion around the earth? Who made the forces that bring them together and keep them together? Where was I before I was born? Who made me? Where did you come from? Who made you? Who made the forces flowing inside us and bringing us closer together? Who made the energy that permeates all that exists? I don't know exactly what the cosmos is. I do know how to pay attention. How to gaze up with you into the evening sky. To be still and to feel blessed. Which is what we've been doing with our time together. What else should we be doing? Isn't it all just fleeting? What is it that we plan to do with our one wild and precious life together? Good morning. My name is Art Stuckey. This little poem is a gem for me. Mary Oliver begins by asking a series of deep questions, origin questions at scales large and small. How has all this world and its life come to be? How do we relate to creatures like this grasshopper? Midway in this big question, she writes, I don't know exactly what a prayer is, but I do know how to pay attention. This is an especially spiritual and personal comment for me because I know that I am often in this same boat too. I have spent much of my life as a geologist in the field, in lots of different situations, sitting in wonder and questioning, trying to pay attention and understanding big questions. Details of mountains and rivers. How do these magnificent landscapes come to be? How about this particular valley? It gets better though, as she goes further into feelings of actively and fully seeking answers, humbly falling into the grass, kneeling in the grass, being idle and being blessed strolling through the fields. What a glorious way to accompany big questions, searching for truth fully involved. So my basic question or response rather to the question of Mary Oliver is yes, I agree. Getting out of one's head and into the field, into the field is indeed a wonderful way for me to live my one and precious life. Thank you, Mary Oliver for asking. I'm Ann Sarka. Considering that by now I've had so many trips around the sun, part of me says, I'm done planning. I'm in review mode. What little brain remembers anything is trying to recall what I already did with my one wild and precious life. And I have an issue with wild. I'm a Taurus. We're known to be dependable, hardworking, and stubborn, to a fault. 
we don't do while. But while sounds good. Maybe in my next life. Precious, I can relate to. And there is life ahead. For starters, I plan to do some things I didn't get to do yet. This past weekend, I missed a chance to try taiko, Japanese drumming. I've always wanted to do that. I plan to continue to paint and make collages. I love that. And to pursue my volunteer efforts, especially to put my shoulder to the wheel on voting, including writing hundreds more postcards through the upcoming elections. I want to be a better listener. Several friends rely on my attentive ear. And I need to stop overdosing on chocolate. Yes, I know how it feels to be addicted. My life thus far has offered me opportunities for growth and to make a difference, for which I'm enormously grateful. I enjoyed all of it. And I thought it was all worthy work, attempting to help bring about a better world. Now we are at a great turning point, a perfect storm, with our democracy at stake, a nimble virus killing millions worldwide, only a crucial few years in which to rescue our damaged planet, and a reawakening to the wounds of racial inequities and injustice. This moment is testing us all and needs us all, the strongest and the wisest, as well as those of us who are just hanging on. We need to be up to the task. There is too much at stake. I've been reading the book of joy, lasting happiness in a changing world, featuring the Tibetan spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, the South African activist and reconciliation leader. These two men who have lived through terrible times exude playfulness, forgiveness, and love for friends and enemies alike. They say that as we pass through difficulties, we can learn from them and find meaning so we can come out the other side, not embittered, but ennobled. So how will I, and how will we go forward? With bravery and fortitude and resilience, let's hope. With compassion and love, let's hope. And maybe, just maybe, with a little bit of chocolate.
Thank you, Paula, and thank you, Anne, Art, Tom, Ruth, Tamara, Jeremy, Mara, Amy, Liam, and Callum, as well as all of the children who contributed artwork for today's service. As we draw our service to a close, we extinguish the chalice and carry within each of us its healing flame the warmth of community and the spark of hope into the days and the week ahead. Please join me in saying our congregational mission statement. We welcome all as we build a loving community to nurture each person's spiritual journey, serve human need and protect the earth, our home. We come to the end of this wonderful service with deeper knowledge of our fellow congregants, love, admiration, enjoyment, and learning at what they've contributed. I want to uh, close today's service with a poem. Um, this one was sent to me by our friend Kristen Glaser, who had found it in the winter issue of the online magazine Rattle. Thanks, Kristen. This is by Nancy Miller Gomez, who says about her poems, mostly they are a collection of things I've noticed that circled some central query. In this case, how are we able to persist when life can be so remarkably challenging and painful? And yet within that pain, we often find the most beauty. So this poem is called By Gomez. Again, it is Nancy Miller Gomez. And this one is called Still. Still, the last apple hangs on into winter. Drops of rain sweat slide down its mottled skin, catch light from the sun and turn gold. Shriveled and brown as a shrunken head, it turns on to it, I'm sorry, it holds on to the branch even while falling further into itself. Isn't persistence beautiful? The woman who shows up daily for her dose of methadone, the man punching the clock shift after shift, though he carries his heart through each day in a cold, empty chest. The small boy who tries to make sense of the lines his teacher has made on the chalkboard. How do we keep on? The bird drops its song over and over, picking it up and dropping it. Little notes spilling down the mountain. My father on his deathbed, eyes still filled with wonder, he lingers longer and longer in the spaces between each breath, stepping carefully onto the ledge of his last thought. And now we close our service with a postlude, a postlude video.
said, add these together, carry the two. Now you, you can do this hard thing. You can do this hard thing. It's not easy, I know, but I believe that it's so. You can do this hard thing. a cold winter station breathing into our gloves it would change me forever leaving for God knows what you carried my bags and you said I'll wait for you you can do this hard thing you can do this hard thing it's not easy i know but i believe that it's so you can do this hard thing late at night i call and you answer the phone the worst it had happened and I did not want to be alone you quietly listened and you said we'll see this through you can do this hard thing I believe that it's so you can do this hard thing Here we stand breathless and breast in hard times Hearts hung like laundry on backyard clothesline just takes a little more time from the muddy ground comes a green volunteer in a place we thought barren new life appears Morning will come whistling some comforting tune for you. You can do this hard thing. You can do this hard thing. It's not easy, I know, but I believe that it's so. You can do this hard thing. Yeah, 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 yeah.